on this day in 1550 B.C., the temple in Jerusalem was completed. On this day in 1862, paper money was issued by this government we now are a part of. What's on the back of the dollar bill? In God we trust. Now, this is not original with me. I read both of these things in this little trivia devotion book I've got. But it said, this is a great idea, I think, so it's not mine, but uh, the authors of this book, uh, pull that dollar bill out each day and take a look at that and have a little devotion time. In God we trust. Kind of think about what I can do to trust God. And I thought, well, that's a great idea because usually we're worshiping that dollar bill that uh, we're, I don't know how we're going to spend it. So anyway, there's a, that's extra to the sermon So <laughs> this morning. Well, as you know, Jason has been leading us in a tour of the seven churches of the book of Revelation. So today we have the church at Pergamum that we're going to look at. And uh, this series has... Uh, you know, I just kind of want you to pretend that we are uh, going on a trip to see these seven churches, and we have the greatest tour host that you could possibly have, the Apostle John, probably the closest friend to Jesus of anybody. He's the tour guide. But, of course, John has some special circumstances. He's imprisoned on an island called Patmos. And um, he's, uh, he preached at Ephesus, which was one of the churches. And this whole thing is kind of modern-day Turkey. And uh, so these seven churches here are what we would call modern-day Turkey. So I don't know, do we have that map so we can take a look at that? Yeah. If you're interested, that's kind of what it looks like. And I know Jason has done something similar there. But um, why in the world would we be interested in seven churches uh, of Revelation uh, that were in modern-day Turkey? Well, for several reasons, uh, we can learn from these churches. And that's pretty much the intention of this whole series that we're talking about here. But what's, what's tragic is, now there were more than seven churches in that time, and of course, the, under the uh, missionary work of the Apostle Paul, the Christianity grew rather rapidly, and, uh, but today, there are no churches still existing like this in modern-day Turkey because in uh, 650 A.D., Islam swept across there, and the sword of Islam hung over that and still continues to hang over that to this day. So we want to see what it was like when John wrote this particular book and when he gave us the revelation from Jesus Christ but he begins it with a tour of seven churches, and we can learn from those seven churches for us today because we hope that surely in this country there'll never be a day when the church no longer exists. So if you got your Bibles, chapter 2 of Revelation, verses 12 to 17, it's not a long passage. None of these are. But let's read about it, and let's, let's see what we can learn about this particular church that would be helpful to us. We are, quote, New Testament Christians. We are people who are trying to follow Christ. All those that come together this morning, if you're part of this church, are uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, so this is the gathering place on the Lord's Day. You know, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Sunday. That's what we worship on. So there's just lots and lots of stuff. And my problem this morning is I don't try to give you too much. And it gets lengthy and you get hungry. So we'll try to get going here. Uh, 
in this whole thing here. Chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 12. He says this, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith with, uh, in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Thus, we've called this the church in a bad environment, or some have called it the church at hell's door, okay? Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. And you have others who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give you some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Wow. Well, there's a lot of stuff there, isn't there? We'll try to unpack this this morning. But in this paragraph of Scripture this morning, as we look at the church at Pergamum, there's two words that I want you to think about. The word... Um, compromise and the word tolerance because it comes out of this passage of scripture now they may not be used in our English translation but in thought they are there this church has a lot to be commended about this church has a lot to be condemned for and we're going to unpack that here this morning but I want you to remember those two Words. Now, you've got to remember as you read the book of Revelation that Rome is in power, and Rome required emperor worship. So as you read this book, which you should read this book, even though you're going to say, I don't understand a thing about it, you will learn some things. But that's one thing you can know. When it was written, Rome was in power. We can't imagine that. We live in a democracy, and we're not worshiping anybody, hopefully, in government, in Washington, we're worshiping God. Now, we could go down that road, but we won't this morning. So, uh, just keep that in mind as we look through this this morning. Verse 12 talks about uh, who the correspondent is here in this particular. He, he writes this. It, the angel of, of the Lord writes this uh, to the angel, the elder, the preacher, the spiritual leader. There in verse 12, again... To the angel of the church in Pergamum write. Well, that's who he's talking about. He, this letter is addressed to a spiritual leader there. And he says in this vision earlier, he talks about one like the Son of Man, meaning like Jesus, who has the double-edged sword in his mouth. Well, the double-edged sword happens to be the Word of God. Revelation 1.16. Or you can look at Hebrews chapter 4.12. We need to never forget Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to joints and marrow. And you that know the parts of the body know that's pretty deep. And uh, soul and spirit, that's your spiritual side. And it is able to judge the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart, the Bible, the Word of God. And so as we open this up, this is what is being said because the sword has to do with both salvation and judgment. The Bible has to do with salvation and judgment. So the Bible will tell you how to be saved. The Bible will tell you whether you're living your life in the way that would be pleasing to Jesus, so therefore it is judging you. So you need to remember that. 
The Bible is a book full of stories of good news about salvation and judgment. So it opens up in verse 12 with this who's writing to whom type of a thing. Now the second piece I want to bring to your mind just for a minute is Pergamum was a city of that day and time. It had been the capital of Asia Minor, that area which is now modern day Turkey, for 300 years. But it also had a temple to the Greek god Zeus. Now, I didn't study much Greek mythology. Some of you that are smarter than me have. So I'll probably have you lecture on that, but we don't want to take the time this morning. But Zeus, as I understand, was the god of the sky, of thunder and lightning. Anyway, it was a god you shouldn't be worshiping, is the point. But uh, that, they had a temple there. It had a library of 200,000 volumes. Now, you might say, big deal. Well, yeah, it is a big deal. That's way before Gutenberg ever came up with the printing press. So the only way you got books in those days was hand copies. So it's a pretty extraordinary place. And they manufactured paper and parchment there. So this is a, this is a pretty good-sized, pretty important kind of a city that, in verse 12, the letter is to the church in this city. So there was a church there could have been started by Paul or one of his disciples. And uh, verse 13 is troubling. He says, you are dwelling in Satan's throne. Now, isn't it interesting? There are two great forces in this world, God and Satan. And you know what's fascinating to me? I I just realized this here uh, in watching a couple of movies, kids' movies, with my grandson, Aiden. (laughs) It's funny how every story there is has the good guys and the bad guys. But we don't believe in God, and we certainly don't believe in Satan. But they've got the good guys and the bad guys, all those writers that write these storylines. It's right there. Why? Because the Bible does say there is a God and there is a devil. And we live in this fallen world in great controversy. But uh, I I just find that to be interesting here when you uh, think about that fact that this place is said to be dwelling in Satan's throne. And, um, you know, Satan wants to destroy the church's testimony. So, again, compromise. Compromise. Somebody said persecution makes a church grow, but compromise leads to apostasy or falling away. uh, That's kind of the opposite of what we think. Oh, persecution, church is going to be wiped out. You read church history, the church grew in persecution. You know one of the greatest uh, pockets of Christianity in the world today is China. (laughs) And... uh, That's because they have some limits. They had a lot more limits in the old days when Chairman Mao was in power since 1949. He's long gone to his reward, I might add. And there's, but it's an underground church, largely in China. Oh, there's a church that's not underground, but the one that's really flourishing and growing. And so you see, God does his work in spite of what others will do. So the church is there in that town, in that influential town. Now, we need to think for a moment about the nature of the church. I believe today we just don't have a proper understanding of what the church is. You've heard it said the church is an organism. That means it's something living. It's not an organization. Now, it will have earmarks of organization. Anytime you get a group of people together, you'll have organization. But the church isn't an organization. It's an organism. It's full of Christian people whose lives should be alive. And yet, uh, and, and actually, the word church in the Greek is ekklesia, which means the called out brethren or sister brothers or sisters okay there isn't a well there's a sister but it holds water it's not the women okay 
You know what it is. I don't have to tell you. So it's an assembly. We have an assembly of people who have named the name of Jesus. That means they've decided to follow him. And that, that group of people meets together as a church. And uh, the old Bible college professor of many years said, when you find the perfect church, don't you dare go in because you'll ruin it because you're not perfect. And that's true, but people are always looking for the perfect church, and uh, I guess that's an all right pursuit, but it might be a disappointing. It's, it's the people, not the building. We know that. Uh, one of my friends, I just asked some of my friends about church and what came to their mind. One of my friends said, church is 24-7. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. He just said, well, what I mean is it's just not about you and I going in and out of the building on Sunday morning. Church is to go on the rest of the week. You're to be the church when you leave the church building. Now, um, it's a place where we can get help. It's open to all. And now get this. Now, this is right out of your devotion book about Wednesday. I was going to find the date, but I didn't. But you can find it. Charles Stanley said, The church welcomes all sinners but we don't welcome sin now you think about it we are sinners but what God is expecting of you and me is that in Jesus Christ we can work through the sin that has kept us back yes we are all sinners none of us are perfect we know that but we are called when we come to church, when we come to Jesus, to get on a path of growth that will help us deal with our sin. So we welcome all sinners, but we don't welcome all sin. We live in a world today that says, well, you know what, uh, we're all sinners. Uh, you know, now brother so-and-so does this and sister so-and-so does that. You know, we're all sinners. Yes, we are. There's that big word in the Bible, though, repent which we're going to talk about in just a minute. And so the church is living. It's people, but it's people on a journey to be better vessels for Jesus. Now, you've got to be as old as me to remember this, but the guy brought this to my attention. A funeral director brought this to my attention, of all people. Uh, there was a phrase in the 1970s for those of you who can remember the 1970s. Some of you weren't even on the scene. So, And I forgot all about this statement. It was said, it might have been sa said by Dr. Howard Hendricks, but I don't know. One of the noted evangelicals said this. Here's what he said. If it wasn't for the storm outside, outside the church, in other words, what's going on outside the church, the world, the culture we live in, if it wasn't for the storm on the outside, you couldn't stand the smell on the inside. You know, that's still true today. I've forgotten all about that. That's a 40-year-old, at least 45, almost 50s statement. So the, the, I just want you to see the church is a place where a lot of imperfect, struggling people attend. That's you and me. Okay, but we've got Jesus and we can make some marvelous strides in our lives if we will just let him. So there was a church in this town. Now, this church in verse 13 is commended. He said, you've remained true to my name. They didn't give up. They didn't sell out. They didn't say we're done. You see, Satan's throne was where it was. It was a town where it was kind of tough. It was a hard place to live and profess Christ. It meant that, they, that they, they had remained true to Christ. This wasn't true of all of the Christians of that day. But Satan wages war against the church, especially churches that are alive. See, he doesn't worry about the dead ones. He's already got them. A dead church. We don't want to be a dead church. Um, 
again, uh, I've told you one of the most inspiring times of our Holy Land trip for me was to go to Caesarea Philippi, and we were there on Sunday morning. Caesarea Philippi, you know, where Jesus said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Peter had the answer to the question, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't build that church on Peter. He built upon Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ. Well, when we got to Caesarea Philippi, I didn't know this. You know what Caesarea Philippi was called? The gates of hell. So Jesus used that common picture, the gates of hell. And he said, you know what? The gates of hell will not prevail against what? My church. That's powerful stuff. I, I don't know whether that trips your trigger like it does me, but it really does. So, you know, they, they had done some things right. But again, what had they done wrong? They'd compromised. They had become tolerant. And the church today is doing the same thing. I, 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 got, I get a magazine every month from Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. You know what was on the cover of the last one? Why pastors don't preach against sin anymore. What? Yeah. Uh, we don't want to talk about that stuff. You know, we don't talk about how you can be a better person. And you know that's not a bad topic for a sermon. But, you know, sometimes we've got to deal with the junk in our lives. Why? Because it keeps us from being more effective for Jesus Christ. That's why. That's, you know, we're not here to beat anybody up. We're not here to point out all your faults. We're just here to help each other be more effective as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we ought to help each other with the junk that's in our lives. And in case you haven't realized, we all have some junk that keeps us from being all that God wants us to be. So really, in a sense, this ought to be a pep rally. This ought to be a lecture on how to be a better person. As long as it's anchored in Scripture and as long as we realize, yes, the Bible does point out some things that you and me have to think about and do some work with. So he talks, he said, you know, you've done some things, but you've tolerated some things. I mean, you can run the gamut today. The, we've given in to the world on sexuality. We want to legal, legalize marijuana, and I'm not talking about the medical as, aspect because that is something to think about. But you talk to the law enforcement people when they talk about legalizing marijuana, that's going to make their job a great lot bigger because there's going to be more intoxicated people out there with that. We've given in to, uh, you know, they want to give porn to the prisoners. Come on, folks. Uh, our values are now shaped by Hollywood and the media, and marriage is no longer looked upon as a sacred thing. Now you say, well, he's just an old crank. Well, I'm trying not to be an old crank. I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, I've found out that once you've lived life, you, you do see things a little bit differently. I'm just saying Jesus is far better than all this, <laughs> and I just hope that we can we can realize that. You see, Christianity is pledging our lives to Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we ought to have a desire to learn all we can from him and about him. The church is the body of Christ here on earth. And I've worked in the church for a number of years, and there's a lot of things that infuriate me, but it is still the body of Christ here on on earth. The church should model the life of Jesus in all that we do, and its members should follow the words and the teachings of Jesus as found in the Bible, and the Bible is to be held up and followed, and we call people to Jesus and teach them to live like him. That's what we're trying to do, and they were commended. They had not bailed out, but they're also condemned in verses 14 and 15. He said, it's interesting, it's, it's only about a few people. So, you know, but what's a, a problem is a few people 
can cause a lot of trouble. <laughs> and uh, the problem was twofold. Now, this is an Old Testament story. He said, you accept the teachings of Balaam. Well, all my life, this story has confused me because the king of Moab is Balak, B-A-L-A-K, but the prophet of God is Balaam. Okay, so I had trouble right from the start. So Balak, the king of Moab, wants Balaam, the prophet of God, to put a curse on God's people. That's what he wants. So Balaam, the prophet, thinks about that a little bit, inquires of God, and God says, no, no way. My people, you're not putting a curse on my people. And so uh, for some reason, he gets on his donkey, and uh, he's going to go talk to Balak. I think he was going to try to talk him out. I don't know what he's going to do. But uh, the donkey, you know, this happens three times, the donkey won't go there. In fact, the donkey sees the angel of the Lord on the road. Wouldn't that have meant something? And the donkey turns back. And Balaam gets mad and beats the donkey. <laughs> Finally, the donkey speaks to him. <laughs> it's a great story. You, it, it's Numbers 22 and 23, and there's a whole lot more to it. But the, the, the gist, of, and see, Revelation uses a lot of Old Testament teaching and figures so at any rate if you read in numbers God's people that were wandering in the wilderness got involved with the women of Moab and committed immorality guess what and God destroys a big bunch of them so that's this they've accepted the teachings of Balaam well it's actually Balak and Moab and you can read the story and you can probably tell it a lot better than I can but that's what was going on here and that's what he said was the problem that they had well Paul addresses the issue of uh, see one of the problems we've got folks is we've got to stay in this world if we're going to influence this world okay but the problem we have is we get to dabbling in some of the world's ways and then we become kind of neutralized because people say, well, you, you know, who are you? You're, you're doing the same things that I'm doing. And uh, uh, you're talking about this Jesus stuff, and I don't get it with the way you live your life. You know, that kind of thing. Well, that's the problem we have. So Paul addresses it. If you want to look at Second Corinthians chapter 6, I uh, used to hear this preached on a lot, but you don't hear it so much anymore. It's, it's 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. All right, we can stop there and have the rest of the afternoon talk about that one. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, which is the devil? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? Well, you can read that and chew on it this afternoon, but that's a good passage of Scripture, and uh, you know... It's like somebody said, it really doesn't matter sometimes what you are doing, but what will it lead to? What will it lead to? Now, I had this discussion with some of my friends here recently, and again, this is, uh, this is old school. We used to teach kids not to try certain things. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's gone, I'm telling you. No, oh, this uh, experiment, uh, be yourself, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, some of those things you experiment with can get a hold of you. And you can't get out of them. I've met a lot of people who wish they hadn't done the initial that now dominates their life. Now, we could give lots of examples, but you're smart enough to know, and I'm not going to take the time because uh, I'm, I'm limited here. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's what he's talking about. There's a few people here, and so this church was doing pretty good. It was to be commended, but there were a few people that were doing some things. And uh, again, we need to be aware of that today in the church, in our lives. Don't even try some things. James 4.4, 4, friendship with the world is hatred toward God. 
James 4.4. 4. Ephesians 5.27, God talks about marriage and the church, and he meant both of them to be holy and blameless. He talks about this group called the Nicolaitans. Well, they were a heretical sect, group, small group, that promoted false teaching, idol worship, and immorality, and they were like the people of Moab. And, they, and if you read about Ephesus that Jason preached on, Ephesus said, no way, we're not messing with those guys. But at Pergamum, they did. So again, we got to be in the world, but we can't take on the ways of the world. We work at jobs. We live in neighborhoods. We join clubs. We are involved in recreation. We send our kids to schools and to colleges. Or they go off to a job or to the military. So I'm just saying you can't withdraw and be your own little group and carry out the great commission of going and making disciples of all the nations. But at the same time, you have to deal with who's influencing whom. And I think I made that grammatically right. I don't know. You can tell me later. That's the issue. Who's doing the influencing? So that's the struggle that we have. So as a follower of Jesus Christ, we must obey the Great Commission. We want to make disciples of all the nations. We want to baptize them. We want to continue to teach them. But we can't do that if we're doing no better ourselves. So in verse 16, there is a command. The command is to repent. Now that's a word that you will not hear on national TV. You will not hear it in a movie. You won't hear it down at the state house. Repent, I don't think. Repent means to turn or to turn around. For those of you who have been in the military and about face, would be repentance, okay? Go in one direction, you turn around and go the other. Uh, so we need to remember that. And uh, the result of no repentance, William Barclay says, the wrath of God is hottest against those who lead others astray. Now that's especially interesting because William Barclay, great Bible scholar, was accused of being a universalist who just simply says, in the end, God's going to save us all. Well, if you really believe the Bible, uh, I don't think you can draw that conclusion. And Barclay's a great guy, and he may not have been a universal, but here, here's what he said. The wrath of God is the hottest against those who lead others astray. So, again, those two words, folks, compromise and tolerance. Now, I know you, you don't want a pharmacist who's tolerant. You don't want a doctor that's tolerant. Well, tolerant of you, maybe, but not in the way he treats you. Okay. Uh, compromise. Well, you want a po couple of politicians to compromise if the issue is clean water. But if the issue is something moral, they maybe can't compromise. So you, you understand all that. And again, the sword brings conviction of sin, and uh, it includes an invitation to God and leads to assurance of salvation. And, but we need to live a life of repentance. And then, of course, verse 17 it's just some counsel there. He talks about hidden manna. Well, in the Old Testament, you remember, manna was what was given to the people while they wandered in the wilderness to keep them alive. And hidden, here, the refreshing food of fellowship with Jesus. And uh, the idea here of warriors coming home from battle also figures into verse 17. So this is a church in a bad environment. It's been called Hell's Headquarters. Uh, that would not be uh, a name that I think the Chamber of Commerce would want to put out on a road sign as you drive into Pergamum. I really don't think so. But that's what John, the Apostle John, in writing to the leaders of the church in Pergamum. And remember, the reason for reading this book of Revelation, verse, verse 3 of the first chapter, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed is those are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. And look at Revelation 1, 19 and 20. Just a little refresher here. 
Right, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And we don't want our lampstand to go out. We want the flame to burn. Two guys, not related to me because they, the, they spell their name differently, but you know Eric Raymond that used to attend here. Well, Rodney and Daryl Raymond preached in Las Vegas for many years. Now, one of those guys is Eric's grandfather, I believe. Rodney and Daryl Raymond, Los Angeles, Nevada. Or Nevada, as my old folks used to say. That's the town up by Ames. Um, and I don't know if they're even still alive, but this was years ago. Las Vegas. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to Las Vegas, but you've heard it called Sin City. Okay, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And there's a lot of bad stuff in, in, in any city. But, you know, there's some good things here. So please mi don't misunderstand that Doug said, oh, I went to Las Vegas. I'm all fouled up. I didn't say that. I'm just saying it's a place where you could get all fouled up if you make some bad choices. But they preached out there. Well, I don't know the extent of their ministry whatsoever, but I know today. Our fellowship of churches have three or four big churches in Las Vegas. Big, I'm talking to, at three and 4,000 people. Now, I'm not saying that to brag, but I wonder if maybe those two gentlemen sowed some seeds or the ones that came later. Uh, in fact, Lincoln Christian Seminary had a pilot program where you could go to seminary out there at one of those churches. So, uh, fascinating. But uh, again, is the church going to be the church in this day that God wants it to be? And one last story. I probably, probably told you this before, but it came up again. Uh, when I was growing up, a large family came to our church. And uh, as, you know, as a kid, you listen to the adults talk. You know, that's what, a, what it really means. Uh, kids are to be seen and not heard. Well, that wasn't a negative thing, really. It was come in here and listen to the adults talk because you might learn something. And I did. This gentleman had been the most notorious guy in a small town he could be. Okay, small towns always had somebody that was just notorious, even by the unchristian crowd. And an evangelist came to town, and the local church preacher took him out to meet this guy and he repented of his past and was baptized, and, and he gave his money. He owned a construction company, and he, he, he gave lots of money to Christian causes. Really changed. Had four or five kids. They were all about my age, and, and so I played with them and that kind of thing. And, and years later, I learned why they left that church where he was one to Christ and came to our church. That church didn't welcome that family and that man who changed so dramatically for some reason. Our church did. And uh, I thought, wow. And we're talking small churches. But you see, we, we want to be accepting of people, welcome the sinner but not the sin, and then for sure when someone comes to Christ, we want to open up our arms wide to help them in their journey and their walk with the Lord. And so I just share that with you this morning. The church that was at Hell's uh, Door uh, is Pergamum. And uh, I don't know, uh, we live near the most populous city in the state of Iowa. We have a ministry to people. And we want to love people and share with them Jesus Christ in whatever way that we can. And we want to keep our eyes open to keeping our, our Bibles open that this is what we're all about. Jesus is in charge of the church. We follow the instruction book of the Bible. And we're here to be a group of people who love each other and get along with each other and is concerned about our neighborhood and the surrounding area. That's